Welcome into episode 194 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. The Bruins had breakup day yesterday. Bridget, you were there. Scott, you were there. Points. And of course, the Bruins ownership and management brass, I believe, are slotted to speak maybe sometime next week. So we'll cover that as well. And I'm sure we'll get a little bit more substance from, from those individuals as far as the members of the team that spoke yesterday, guys, and Bridget, we still have to get all your feedback on what happened because um, we haven't heard from you since they do lost we, game seven. Yeah, I guess we do. We, we will. There'll be time for that. But, you know, just I guess, guys, just what, what are your what are your main takeaways from from breakup day? Obviously, there is some free agents that are up in the air and there's the future of Bergeron and Krejci that will be asked until the end of time. So I'm going to throw it to you guys now. I think my my takeaway First, as it relates to the first round loss and collapse, is two days later they're still in shock. Like yeah. a couple guys literally, literally even said it. Like I don't really know how to answer for this right now. Like I, you know, haven't had enough time to process it. Um, you know, I don't think anyone had like a great explanation for what happened. The you know some guys took personal responsibility said, you know, I second guess could I have done this better, that better made this play, that play Connor Clifton said he, you know, was like really down himself and apologetic about the way he played in game six. Um, you know, said he with fresh legs, he thought he could bring some, some energy to the series and was in a good spot to make a positive contribution and like, just, just didn't happen. Like just had a bad game. Um, so, you know, it, like it was obviously a pretty, pretty dour mood. And then the other takeaway for me was, you know, all the guys who are pending free agents that we know they're not going to be able to keep all of them because they have eight unrestricted free agents, three restricted free agents and about five million dollars of cap space. But everyone wants to be back, basically, like every, almost to a man. They all said like their priority would be to come back if if there's room for them, if it works out. So obviously it's not going to work out for all of them, but um, you know, I do think you heard a lot of that too, of guys who as much as possible want to try to keep this together and do it again. But the realities of a, of a salary cap league and, you know, a cap that's probably only going up by a million dollars is that's not going to be possible. There's going to have to be a lot of turnover. Yeah, a lot of turnover. Um, and I mean, a lot of answers you expect from free agents um, and, you know, Bergeron and Krejci being two of them. But uh, they're, they're always going to say, oh, you know, I want to come back. But I did get the sense that, and I don't know if this is a language barrier thing um, or if he didn't understand the question necessarily, but Orlov was asked whether or not he would go back to Washington. And he said that was on his list. I think it was, I didn't know if he maybe misunderstood that he and was like talking about going back to live in Washington, like for the off season well, or like literally go back and play in Washington would be like up there for him. Yeah. Um, I think there was uh, on Orla specifically. I, I think there was a lot of kind of misinterpretation of what he said. My yeah. read, like going back and watching and listening to it again this morning was more like, cause yesterday the narrative was like, Oh, he wants to go back to Washington. I got the complete opposite impression. Like, like he, he literally says at one point, like he's sure they're going to talk to his agent, but uh, his, his quote was like, but they traded me. So I don't know if it's going to work out, but I guess we'll see. Like to me, it sounded more like he didn't really think they were an option. Mm -hmm. And, and he did say at one point too, like he, you know, like he might go back to Washington now. And I, I took that to mean because his family's there, like they, they didn't move up here. So I, I just think I language probably is part of it, but I think a lot got lost in, in how some of his answers got kind of disseminated out on Twitter. Yeah. But even I, when I was listening to him live, I thought that maybe he meant going to play there. Um, so I do think some of it was, I don't like when you listen back to it, you're like, oh, maybe he just said it wrong. Like um, I do have my one source. <laughs> in Washington that I I'll ask to see if Washington wants him back. Cause um, 
the one person I know that's close to the Capitals would probably know that. Um, but yeah, he's, so he was the only one who kind of answered it. That wasn't just like, yeah, I want to stay in Boston. Um, but, but he did have a lot of positive things to say though, about his time in Boston. Like he talked about how, you know, it, it's important for him to enjoy hockey. And he found that again in Boston. Like, so, you know, almost suggests like he wasn't really having fun in Washington at the end. So, which is kind of what I got from the person that I know that's connected to the Capitals was that they, he was not sad to go. Um, and that there's a tiny bit of dysfunction going on in Washington at the time. Um, and definitely they weren't happy with the decision to be sellers, but, um, so yeah, it, Orlov was interesting and kind of you could interpret, I guess people did interpret things different ways. Um, but he is going to be a contract that either way might be too big for the Bruins to want to take on. Um, and they're going to have to decide whether or not they want to focus on their defense or, you know, do they want to bring back weapons like Bertuzzi? Will they even have the option to bring back either? Um I think maybe also just to start with like the less controversial, not less controversial, but like um, the unrestricted free agents who obviously they'll be negotiating with the Bruins first before anything else could happen. Um, Trent Frederick was talking about this. Um, he restricted the, free agents. I'm sorry. Restricted. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Trent Frederick is one of the restricted free agents. And so he was asked about it and he was like, well, yeah, no, my agents in negotiations with Sweeney and and like I want to be in a Bruins sweater for as long as possible. So pretty much he I think he wants a pretty long term deal if he can get one in negotiations. Um, and but then he was laughing like, what other choice do I have? <laughs> he's funny because he just says like whatever he's actually thinking. He's like the least political answers you'll get. And he's just kind of like he kind of like Gronk where he's just like. I play hockey and I just, that's my life. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's just kind of how he is. Thought enters head, escapes mouth. Like. Yeah, exactly. But he's so, he's so like, he was one of the only guys that was in like a decent mood where he was just like, yeah, you know, I play hockey. I'm going to get paid. Like he was just, I don't know. He's always kind of in a good mood. Um, So he was saying he's completely hands off in those negotiations, which isn't very surprising. Um. I think that if we want to talk about what he deserves, he brought his value up for sure this season um, with career best numbers. And you kind of wonder how even those restricted free agent um, negotiations are going to go because Swayman's another one and Swayman's value has also gone up. Um, and I, the Bruins are in a, in a tough situation because pretty much everybody on their team that could leave had a better season than they had in years past and their value went up. That is true. There's a lot to digest there because there's a lot of free agents on this team and restricted and unrestricted. So I don't really know exactly where you guys want to take this. I mean, if you want to start with like the Bertuzzi versus Orloff, if you want to prioritize one or the other, because you guys were talking more so about Orloff earlier, I, I really don't care what he wants to do. I don't think the Bruins need him to come back at, at the at the term and dollar that he's probably going to ask for in a final contract. I think he's a good player, great player, a little bit older. I, I just feel like if you're the Bruins, if you, look, you look towards next season and hopefully the seasons to come. Mason Lora is a guy who can slot in on that left side. Hopefully as soon as next year, can can McAvoy and Lindholm kind of carry the weight until Lora becomes an NHL player at some point next year and you can add some of that that depth from uh, from the farm system. I think that's probably what they would do because then you can at least try to prioritize Bertuzzi if you would like. You can't do both of them. And I just think that Bertuzzi's younger. He fits a position of need that the Bruins don't really have a ton of in the system, whereas Lorai could come in and replace an Orloff uh, eventually. And so I think, I guess that's a question. Would you would you guys prioritize Orloff over Bertuzzi or vice versa? Just to keep it to those two real quick. Because because they both came into Boston at the deadline and they both played fantastic, I thought. yes. Yes, Bertuzzi had a couple of turnovers, but if we're being honest, guys, by and large, he was one of the Bruins' best forwards in the in the seven game series against Florida. And Orloff had a, you know five or six primary assists in the series, and and he was really good too. So both those guys came to Boston. They did exactly what Don Sweeney hoped that they would do. 
for this team. And the Bruins are not at home right now because of their play in the playoffs. Yeah. I, I guess I would prioritize Bertuzzi simply because of age more than anything. Like he's in his prime years. He's still in his twenties. Orlov will be turning 32 before next season begins. And you know, like, look, if, if Orlov wanted to come back on just like a short term three year deal or something, awesome. But realistically, this is probably the last big payday of his career. And I'm sure, which he said, he's, yeah, he's gonna, you know, he's probably gonna want like that five or six year deal. So that takes him into his later 30s and to the point where, you know, maybe he's retiring or playing it a year at a time at that point. So he, he I, said, I don't, this will be my last contract. In yeah, his, in his interview, so that kind of takes the short term stuff off the table. You'd think. Yeah, and I just I don't I don't think that's the the best move for the Bruins to give five or six years to a defenseman in his thirties. Even even though you know a couple defensive zone misplays aside, I thought Orlov was a really good fit, and he's clearly, you know, he's clearly what they've been looking for in that left side. That you know something much more well rounded than a. Grizzly, Riley, Forbord, another guy who can play in the top four behind Lindholm, but it just doesn't make a ton of sense to me if it's if he's going to look for that longer term deal and kind of the highest bidder, that one last good payday. It's probably not going to be with the Bruins. Um, so you know, Bertuzzi, I think lines up more with sort of where this team's going to go over the next few years, which is whether it's next year or the year after. And, you know, we haven't even really talked about Bergeron and Krejci yet, but they both said, you know, they're going to talk things through with family before they make a decision. Uh, Krejci said he expects to make a decision in the next couple of weeks. My gut is that decision will probably be to retire, um, but we'll see. And Bergeron said he doesn't have a timeline, but did note that last year he – wanted to make sure he let Don Sweeney know before free agency started. So that would put it at the end of June. So obviously there's some time there. Um, I do think Bergeron's a little more up in the air, uh, especially after yesterday. Like I, it's, it can be hard to read Bergeron at times, but I did think there was like some actual doubt in, in terms of how he talked, how he answered questions where like, I, I didn't, I didn't get the sense that like he's already decided and he's just going to give diplomatic answers. Like I, I felt like there was actually some, you know, some uncertainty and, and the way he said, like, you know, it's too early to even make a rational decision right now. Um, I I do think like there's going to be a real debate for him and, and conversations with his family. Um, but at what I was getting at with Bertuzzi in the timeline is at, at some point, there's going to be a reset and you're going to take a step back for a year or two. And that might be as early as this summer. So Bertuzzi will can still be in his prime when you get to the other side of, you know, a year or two step back reset, whatever you want to call it. Like they had in 2015 when Don Sweeney took over as GM where you're not going full rebuild. You're not, you know, blowing it up, but you're you're taking a step back and you're resetting the books and you're getting a little younger and you're trying to get back in, you know, the next couple of years. So I would probably prioritize Bertuzzi there. The problem with all this is like, like we've said, they have so little cap space. So it's also going to depend on who can they trade away? What kind of value can they get? Um, you know, we know the names there. Like, are you, you probably, you're trying to trade at least one defenseman. Yeah. Grizzly, Forbert, Riley, all have one year left. I don't know what the value for any or all of them is. Um, you might have to trade a forward, especially if you're committing to Bertuzzi. You know, so does that open up Taylor Hall or Jake DeBrusque as a trade possibility? Are you looking at trading one of your goalies? Lena Salmark has two years left to five million per year. You could get a lot cheaper at the goalie position by going Swayman as restricted free agent and Brandon Bussey as your backup. So I think all that's on the table. I think they're going to be looking at every option. 
But as far as, you know, the newcomers who are free agents, to me, Bertuzzi makes more sense than Orlov. I, Scott, you, you, I don't even know where to start with that. So I guess I'll start with Brian's question, um, which was about Bertuzzi. Um, so right now he's, I believe his last contract looking at it now is he was getting 2375000 was this past contract for him. He's 27 years old. Um, and he's going to go up and pay from there and probably would want a mid to long range contract, you would think. So um do, do you want so evolving hockey has their contract projections out and they're usually for in a lot of cases, they're like relatively close to the amount in terms of projected deals. For Bertuzzi, they project four years by five and a half million a year. Well, that's a pretty big step up from his last contract. So yeah, level, so I mean he's got he's double. got a, a thirty goal season in there since then. Mm -hmm. He just tied for the team lead in points in a playoff series. So, you know, yeah, I think it is going to be a pretty big jump. Yeah, it's you're looking at almost double <laughs> the contract for him, um, and you don't have you don't even have five million. So, <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, if they could find a way to bring him back, I think that he was a good fit with the team. Um, I think he still probably has even more growth he could do here in Boston in terms of um, chemistry, um, which was at times, you know, very good, him and Pasternak. Other times you could tell that they hadn't been together, like not just him and Pasternak, but him with other lines um, that they hadn't been together all that long and they're still working on things. So, um, I think his ceiling is higher even than what he showed um, because he could work on some of those, you know, issues with the turnovers. He was entertaining. I'll say that. Um, I didn't necessarily know what they were getting when they got him in terms of how his personality would really mesh with the team. And he seemed to be good. I mean, you, you always wonder when you have a guy coming in that has beef with like several players on your team, what it's actually going to be like in the locker room. And Marshawn, when he was answering his questions yesterday, kept joking about, he's like, they're like, how is it to play, you know, playing with the guys that you hate? He goes, I still hate that guy, but he was kidding. Um, <laughs> so like it, it ended up being a decent fit, um, even in the locker room, which probably would have been more your question um, when he was brought in. So I don't have an issue with them trying to get him uh, to come back, but I just feel like he's going to get more somewhere else. So that becomes your main problem with a lot of these guys is that you, even if you want them, like other teams probably want them just as bad. Bertuzzi showed um, what his value could be. Uh, so that could be difficult. I wouldn't be surprised if Orloff was kind of out. Clifton feels like he's out. Um, yeah. And in terms of Hathaway, if we're talking about the three guys that they added at the deadline, Hathaway's, you know, his contract isn't going to be as big, but you can fill a fourth line role with other guys. Um, and he had some stretches before the playoffs that he, he looked like a good fit and you wanted more from him in the playoffs though. Um, with what we, what you think he can bring is his ability to, you know, he's had the most hits, um, but he's also an agitator and he can get in front, like cause havoc in front of the net. You would have liked to see more from him in the playoffs in that role. So uh, to answer that, I guess we'll throw it back to Brian for, for his response, and then we can hit some of the other stuff Scott talked about, like Bergeron and Krejci. Uh What was the question again? Uh, oh, would you oh, rather have Bertuzzi? Or... <laughs> oh, that's right. 20 minutes later. Uh, no, I'm with you guys. I would say Bertuzzi. I think it's just a matter of like – look, if, if Ber it just depends. This whole, this whole episode today really is kind of a little bit premature as far as – uh, outlook for next year for the Bruins because we have to hear what the management says and what the ownership brass says. Uh, and there's obviously two looming decisions like like you guys are talking about with Krejci and Bergeron. I I, I agree with Scott. I think Krejci's done. 
as far as Bergeron goes, I, I think he's sitting there asking. Ryan, himself, you're supposed to answer Bertuzzi Orloff <laughs> first. Bertuzzi. <laughs> Bertuzzi. Okay, that was it. All right. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think I I think I preface the question with my initial thoughts on it, but I would say Bertuzzi. Um, but it, it, like I said, though, it all depends on on what like if certain guys are leaving, right? So my my point is. If Bergeron and Krejci stay, let's just say, okay, now your your cap is even that much more tight because you have the bonuses carrying over and you'd have to pay them something this year. If they're gone, the reason I bring them up is because the Bruins ownership will not they will not accept a rebuild. Okay, this is this is something that they've been on record saying, and and so if Bergeron and Krejci go, I think there's going to be a real uh, a strong effort by the Bruins to try to make sure they can sign some legitimate talent up front. And Bertuzzi fits that bill. I think there's plenty of guys that are free agents on this Bruins team, uh, restricted, unrestricted, that they're a dime a dozen. Thomas Nosek, I like him. They can replace him internally. Same with Garnet Hathaway, like let him go. Orloff does not fit the bill for the Bruins long term. Um, you know, Forbert, see you later. Riley, they buried him in a year, so I don't think they care if they get rid of him. Uh, it's just a matter of if they can trade him. Forbert, though, that he's he's got another year, so it depends on you know whether you can trade him or if he has any value. Yeah, I, there's there's just this. I guess what I'm saying is like the, the the if Bergeron goes, like Pavel Zaka, the addition of Pavel Zaka last year really mitigates my concerns for them having to to have a full rebuild because if you had no Zaka to fill that that number two center for the future, now you're talking you gotta find two centers. You already you have Zaka. Like you, you can plug him in and you won't miss you won't even notice Krejci's gone. Hell Krejci wasn't even here last year. Eric Holler replaced him. <laughs> it's like, I mean not yeah, yeah, yeah. He did kind of replace him actually positionally. But my point is you just have to focus on replacing Bergeron, whenever that is, for your, for your number one center. The other guys, they're gonna come and go, but you gotta figure out who your, you know, who your number one center is down the line. My point is that's not insurmountable. Okay, so I need, we need, we all need to see and hear from ownership and management, and we need to see what they're, what they're feeling, and and we need to see what Bergeron and Krejci decide, mainly Bergeron, and that is gonna depend. That's gonna change. Don Sweeney has probably a million different directions he's going to go this offseason depending on what Bergeron just decides. There's a, there's a lot of tough decisions that if Bergeron leaves, he might not have to face right away, but if he stays, there's going to be some some decisions to be made and it's just really difficult for us here to right now, not even a week after game 7 to really dissect what that is. So I'm hoping next week we might have a little bit more clarity and certainly throughout the offseason, but as far as the personnel decisions going forward this offseason, it's going to be a crapshoot, and it's really tough for us to gauge because nobody really knows, which is why I would I would prefer that eventually we, we more so just talk about um, like the attitudes and, and, and the quotes you guys took away from Media Day because that is – we need to like button up this 2022-2023 Bruins season before we can look at too far ahead, right? And like we talked about before we started recording, there were some – maybe some not great attitudes like and just like i just i just didn't i sensed frustration i sensed that they were upset that they lost obviously why would you not be but i don't know i i just got the sense that that they were a little bit arrogant and and just thought that their shit didn't stink and that they were going to be the harlem globetrotters this postseason and they learned a lesson that quite frankly they should have learned every single year since they won the cup because they've lost every single year since they won the cup and there's lessons that they should have learned in 2019. And it's like you're hearing these guys talk yesterday about like whatever, like like just how they can't believe what happened and and, and they're they're shocked. Like you guys, well, why are you shocked? This is not this is not a team that was rebuilding for five years and finally made the playoffs and and, and just got overwhelmed. Like this team is a playoff tested team. Why were they so shell shocked by a good Florida, but not great Florida team. No, I, I don't think they were shocked that the Panthers were good. I think, I think they just shocked that the season's over and it didn't go nearly as long as they thought it was going to and expected it to. Like I, I haven't gotten the sense that like this team's arrogant or that they thought too highly of themselves. Like I, I think they took the Panthers seriously. I think, you know, Marshawn was talking up the Panthers before game one. Um, and I think that kind of echoed through the locker room. Like I, 
I don't think they were shocked by the Panthers. I think they're they're shocked by themselves. I think they're shocked that this ended so soon that they were up three one and blew it. Like to me, that when I say like they sounded shocked yesterday, I think it's more because of that. I think it's about them. I don't think it's really anything to do with underestimating their opponent or thinking they, you know, it was like their God given right to win or anything like that. I just think they were expect just like all of us, they were expecting to go on a long run. They were expecting to play into June. Um, They certainly were not expecting to lose in the first round after being up three to one. And I just feel like two days hasn't been enough time for them to process it. I think a lot of them hung out together on Monday after losing game seven a couple guys kind of alluded to that. Jake DeBrus talked about it a little, and they said, like, you know, it was just, like, quiet, and, like, none of them could really figure out, like, what happened. They were still just shocked. Um, so I don't think it was arrogance so much as as they just had high expectations, and rightly so after the season they had. Like, they, they should have had high expectations for themselves. Um, and... Yeah, the, like like all of us, they're just they're stunned that it's over so soon. Yeah, and I, I got the sense that they're surprised and just really did not know how they are like their individual performances looked one way in the regular season and then just did not translate into the postseason. Like I'm sure a lot of them were, you know, just think about how many clean plays Lindholm made in the regular season. And then all of a sudden now the plays don't look so clean and they don't look, you know, there's, there's misconnections on passes. There's issues knowing where guys are, there's turnovers, there's um, panic. Like how did that creep into their game? I think they really honestly don't know. Like they, they didn't feel like they were, they didn't really know where it came from that this team just, didn't look like the Bruins anymore. If, if, if we're being real, like that game too, I, when, when I was up there, I was, I didn't know what I was watching. I was like, this isn't the same team uh, that we've seen the whole season. I didn't even, I was like, this doesn't look like we, what we've watched at all. And I think they just don't even know how that happened to them. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the, I like the irony of calling it breakup day was this time. It actually really felt like, like the shock of going through a breakup, like, like a blind side breakup uh, where it's like, what happened? Like, I did not see that coming. Like this was not who we, we thought we were. Um, and I didn't get the sense of arrogance from any of the guys I talked to. I didn't talk to everyone, but um, I think that it is general shock. And I will say it felt like shock immediately after that overtime goal goes in for the Panthers like it felt like instant shock among the even like reporters the the marketing people like there were people in tears up on the ninth floor who were just absolutely not expecting this to end the way it did um like we, some of the we, people we that were crying Scott? The, it was Scott I wasn't gonna yeah say but it. It was Scott. that was only because they ran out of popcorn though that that wasn't yeah. the game yeah, they shut the popcorn machine off for overtime. So Scott was crying. Um, but no, like the marketing people, like it was just pure, I don't know, shock. It was like a bad breakup. It really was. Um, so to that, no, Brian, I didn't I didn't get that since it was arrogance. I just think, well, I mean, I even planned my vacations later in the year because I thought for sure this is going to be going till June. And they've a lot of them mentioned that we thought we were going to be playing together till June. Now, all of a sudden, we may never play together again. Um, and, you know, that end of career sneaks up quickly on Krejci and Bergeron if they decide not to come back. Right. All that stuff just snuck up on them. I mean, uh, they thought yeah. they had more time. I mean, look, look, this is kind of my point, though, guys. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily mean they were arrogant in the sense where, like, they're walking around saying, "Ha ha, look at us, we're better than everybody else." I think arrogance can creep into your game just, just by, just by how how successful their regular season was. This is my point. They they don't have a right to be shocked because this team is far too experienced, and even this current group, like. It's easy to sit there and look at Bergeron, Krejci, and Martian and be like, these guys have been in the league for you know 10 to 20 years. 
depending on which guy we're talking about. They've been to three cup finals. Bergeron's put in 14 game sevens. Like it's easy to point at them and say, of course they're experienced. All right. But a lot of the guys on that team also played in the cup finals a few years ago. Like they know what it takes to play in the postseason, or they should. And the fact that like, here's what, here's what blows my mind. Okay. Did Matthew Kachuk and Sam Bennett, Verhage, Montour in particular, did those guys have a great series? Sure. They absolutely did. And Sam Bennett returning back in the lineup changed the tenor of the series. No doubt about it. Those guys played great. All right. But the Florida Panthers didn't do anything out of the ordinary to beat this Bruins team. Their best players were their best players. Paul Maurice did not reinvent the wheel. There was no genius, you know, one, three, one neutral zone trap. The Bruins, they just, Florida just played hard. They outworked Boston. So for the Bruins to lose that series after being up the way that they were both in the series and in game six and seven in the third period, and then to lose, because they were being, they were, they were being, they were making unforced errors, and they were getting outworked. To sit there after the season and now say we're ju- we're just shocked, like we're shocked. Well, it's like, why? Like, why, why? Why are you shocked? Like, you like you didn't work hard enough to do it, and why? And the question is, why weren't you working hard enough? And that's what I'm saying about the arrogance. It's almost like it was subconscious. Like their desperation level was not w- where Florida's was. You can't tell me. You can't tell me they outworked Florida. They just, they just didn't. And and Mike and and what pisses me off is when I see a team that top to bottom has all the talent in the world get out work. Now they're now they lose, and now they're just shocked. But they've been around the block a few times for my liking to be shocked by playoff by what it takes to win in the playoffs. So maybe I'm being a little hard on them, but this is just the way that I feel after watching that team and watching that series. I think some of that's fair, but I also I don't think like they hit cruise control I, I i just don't i don't think they expect it to be easy at at any point and you know i think at times they they even as the series was slipping away they showed fight they kept you know they kept coming back in game five and game six and um you know scoring the next goal going back up they came back from two nothing down in game seven like that they, they worked it's not like they totally rolled over i i think what what they really struggle with is why did those uncharacteristic mistakes happen? Like why do those turnovers keep happening? Um, and I think, well, no one's going to say it because they're not going to throw anyone under, under the bus. I think it's also shocked that like when they did make a mistake, it ended up in the back of the net, like almost every time. And that wasn't there this year. They got the bailout saves during the season. I want to, we had a quote from Derek Forbert, who I, Bridget knows this from Sunday skate pre-show chats. Like I usually kind of mock anytime, you know, this Forbert audio, cause he's not, he's not the most exciting interview and he tends to give very short answers, but I actually thought his quote from yesterday and he definitely was not intending to like throw goaltending on the, under the bus, but he, he was asked about, you know, why the Panthers four check. Actually, I asked him why, the Panthers forecheck gave them so many problems and they weren't really able to adjust. And he said, we definitely had some uncharacteristic turnovers. I didn't really feel like we were hemmed in our zone too much. I don't know what the zone time comparison was. It just seemed like they were very opportunistic. And every time we'd make one of those little mistakes, it ended up in the back of our net. And like, I think that's what like a lot of guys were going through is yeah, we made uncharacteristic mistakes and we don't really know why. And also they kept every time we did, they made us pay. And that's not usually how hockey works. Like usually you get away with a couple of mistakes, whether, you know, because the other team shoots into the goalie's chest, misses the net, your goalie makes a save. Like it it did seem like Florida was capitalizing on almost all of like the most blatant mistakes. So it's yeah. Like you deserve that. You're the one who made the mistake. So if they, if they, keep making you pay over and over again, then you you have it coming. Like that's on you, but you know, the Panthers made mistakes. Then Bruins didn't capitalize on all of them. Martian gets a free breakaway at the end of game five off a Panthers mistake. Series is over. If he buries it, he doesn't like, you know, so it's, so I think like that's where the shock is, is like, it's, they don't 
really fully understand why they couldn't stop making those mistakes. And there's also the shock that the, the unspoken part to me, because they're not going to throw their goalies under the bus is like, man, like what happened to that one or two extra saves that we got all year? Like, I don't know that that's, that's my opinion, obviously the last part, but I, I do think it's part of it. Do you think another unspoken part of it is maybe shock that the, the coaching decisions to move some guys to certain spots didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and especially in particular that game that Bergeron came back and splitting him and Marchand up. And I just feel like maybe some of the, the, the that caused confusion too. Like that, that broke up players who'd been playing together the whole year and some of it was necessity, but when Bergeron came back, there was no reason not to put him back with, Marshawn and DeBrusque and that was one of the things Montgomery said he regretted doing was waiting too long to put them back together um, and not starting out the game with them together I think that was game five Um, and I did feel like another unspoken thing was no one really asked about coaching no one really asked about that um, how that played into the series as well so I feel like Montgomery did some things that he wasn't doing in the regular season that he did in the playoffs or even, you know, um, when he didn't necessarily have to, obviously for the first few games when Bergeron was gone and when Krejci and Bergeron were gone, there were moves that needed to be made, but those were the games that things went well. Um, Yeah. The injuries too were another thing that I feel like every player got asked um, because it wasn't clear which players were actually fully healthy. Um, And it, I mean, Allmark had some comments about, how I wasn't injured, I was hurt, Um, which those are two different things. One you can play through and one you can't. And then the rest of the questions after that following up were like about, okay, well, like how did you think that you could go? Did you like, at what point would you have said um, you weren't able to go? I asked him about like, was it, were you playing through pain that was worse than like pain that you played through before? Um, which he just said, kept answering, like, I felt like I had everything I needed to, to play. Um, so I don't know. Um, he, there was a lot, there's really still a lot to get through. The injuries were another thing that were kind of like the elephant in the room. Yeah. I'm going to play the world's smallest violin for that. It's the first round of the playoffs. And I don't think anybody in the Bruins besides Bergeron's disc and a couple of tweaks for a couple of guys was was holding this team back. And you can't tell me Florida's well, on crazy. playing stuff too. I mean, look at – I mean, Sam Bennett just came back from – Sam Bennett comes back from an injury in games in game two and is one of the more effective players in the series. And, like, well, so he's still playing through something, I would imagine. But Bar- Barkov was sick early in the series. Paul Pelmarie said it's, – That's different than if it's your goalie, right? Your goalie has to be 100%. True. Like it's, yeah, but then it's like, then don't play him then. And, and, right. that's, and, that's, and that's your point. I, I understand you're not – you know, that's not what you're saying, Bridget. I get it. But like, as far as like, but it's not like it was like game six or seven of the cup finals and you're, and you're two months into this grueling play. Got, got, they played, they played seven games in a week and a half. What and- I'm saying, what what I'm saying is I think he, he was too hurt to play. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's on, on him, but I'm adding that into the coaching decisions that were made that weren't, weren't the right coaching decisions. So like, like I said, that was another unspoken thing was like some of the decisions that were made by uh, whether it was Montgomery or goalie Bob, like these were decisions that nobody was willing to criticize from the team, but that we all know happened, right? Like if Allmark really was hurt, why are we still getting him in net rather than Swayman? And that's a decision that needed to be made by coaching that didn't get made hundred percent. Yeah. Like I, I, I would have hoped that after, and, and I guess we, we don't know exactly how this decision played out. Maybe we'll learn more next week when we talk to Montgomery and Sweeney, but you would have hoped that after two years ago, like they wouldn't just be taking players words for it because Tuka. <laughs> one of the things like Bruce Cassidy said over and over again, that series was like, yeah, he talked to Rask and he says he can play and he can do everything he has to do. And it's like, but we all saw with our eyes that he wasn't able to. And I feel like it was the same thing with Allmark, where it's like, yeah, he can tell you he can do everything and he can go out and practice or whatever and make this movement and that movement. 
But then when you get like into the heat of a game, it's just different. And we all like we we said it. We all felt like you, you'd watched him, and he just looked off. Like he looked a little slower, a little more scrambly. And it's like, you know, and we're not goalie Bob. We haven't studied goaltending every single day for our entire lives. But it's like sometimes I wonder if people can get too close that they're almost blinded. Where it's like that they have to see the same thing we're seeing, but are they almost like too close where it's like now they're breaking it down into like, you know, every little millimeter of a movement and like timing it. And it's like, and not just doing the sort of simple thing that we do, which is like, he doesn't look like he looked three weeks ago. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's just, and it's so odd too, because you have swimming. Like if they, you know, if their backup goalie wasn't as good, nearly as good, like you would get it. You would get just sticking with your Vezina guy. But Swayman was like just as good the second half. All they told us was how much they trust him and would believe in him to go in. And, and that's what they said going to game seven when they finally made the switch. And it's like, well, you couldn't have trusted them that much if you're sticking with Omar clearly being banged up. Like, yeah, that's still, you know, we'll see if we get more answers about the goaltending next week, but that definitely still stands out as like an unanswered question and just something that really doesn't make sense. No matter what all Mark says. And like, I, I get what he's saying. And he certainly seemed annoyed by the, by Kevin Weeks's report that it was, you know, debilitating and affected his movement. Like he clearly disagreed with that assertion, but you well, know. like, where does Kevin Weeks get that then? Uh, I mean, it could be an agent trying to make an excuse. It, it, yeah. at, you know, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, unless unless Swayman was playing through something as bad as Allmark or worse, like, is there, at the bare minimum, Swayman should have played game six uh, before he even got to game seven. But just real quick to jump back to, uh, to, to Derek Forbert's comments, Scott. Were the Florida Panthers opportunistic? Yeah. But let's not let's not and and nobody here is right. But let's not act like the Bruins goaltending was was just giving up everything. Like game one, the Bruins sucked, and I think and I think Allmark is a big reason that they were able to win that game. The Bruins did not play well in game one, so if it's not for him, then they go down in the series right away, in my opinion. Game seven, the Bruins had eighteen giveaways to Florida's nine. So for Forbert to sit there and say, yeah, we had a couple of uncharacteristic. No, 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 no. You doubled your opponent in giveaways in game seven. And, and you know, you mentioned the Marshan breakaway in game five that Bobrovsky stopped and gave the Panthers another chance at life. Swayman stopped Matthew Kachuk in game seven of overtime in a breakaway. And the Bruins couldn't take advantage of that breath of, of fresh air. And now, so like, it's not like every, the Bruins, they didn't make a ton of turnovers, but when they did, oh, they ended up in the back. No, 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 no. That's not the narrative that should be out there. Not, nobody here is saying that. I know. I'm just saying, like, was Allmark good in the middle of the series or in games five and six? No. But the Bruins' defense, their puck management was atrocious. Their game management was atrocious. Their awareness, yeah, the goaltending at times, it, 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 they weren't that extra save. Like, Scott, you called it an extra save. But my God, like they would have had to have made so many extra saves because this Bruins team was so so out of sync. But not really. I mean, it really was one extra save. Like, yeah, one more save wins you game seven. One one more and and one less turnover wins you game six or game five. I know. Yeah, it's it's all together. It's not all together. It's not one or the other, but both were major letdowns. The the, the team defense, not even just the defenseman, the, the team defense and the goaltending were both major letdowns especially because that was your biggest strength all year. You gave up nearly half a goal less per game than any other team in the in the NHL. And then both totally fell apart in in the playoffs. I know. Well, I think part of the reason up. for the shock is that at like you can think of about 100 different plays that if it had gone a, different by like a centimeter or by a second then this series would have been over, Um, you know, maybe in five or six, not even just seven, right? Like we can think of 
just these split second plays that if those, if you don't make that pass, it, like that Bertuzzi turnover out in front of the net, well, the Bruins probably win that game. Um, if Allmark doesn't come out and wrap the puck around and, you know, it gets stolen and they lose in overtime in game five, like, okay, that you're probably on to the next round then. Like each guy was going through and saying, like Marshawn was, was the breakaway. Orlov said, I hit a post. Um, like each guy had these different moments that they that are bothering them. For yeah. if, it, if this one little thing had gone an inch or even a centimeter or I got it like – it was so close so many times. And I think that's what makes it so shocking to them. The, yeah. Brent, Brandon Carlo getting that puck in the scrum and hits the crossbar. But um, uh, the, the, Pasta the 30, 30 seconds into overtime beats Bobrovsky over the blocker and it hits the knob of a stick. Like, yeah. The yeah, hand you, pass by that Jake DeBrusque, like by a centimeter touched with his glove um, that took back a Carlo goal. Like there's, there was so many. Yeah, but, but but regardless of who wins the series, both teams are going to have those moments, though. So it's just like, and, and it's I'm just, that's, that's why what, it's. Those are the things that are haunting them and adding yeah. to the shock. Well, I mean, look, you're not going to sit here and hear me defend the team. I thought they, I thought, I, I thought they were careless. I thought that for whatever reason, they weren't the team they were in the regular season, which is obvious. And, and my, my biggest question, I guess, is just, is why? And, 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 like we talked about it for 40 minutes, 45 minutes at this point, and you can sit there and say, well, maybe the goaltending let them down here, the defense let them down here, the forwards didn't capitalize on this opportunity. My question is, like, why? Like, like what was Florida doing? And, like, and if it wasn't something that Florida was doing, then that it all comes back to, like, it's just an inexcusable loss for the Bruins. They just they didn't have that – they just didn't have that – you want to call it clutch performance? Like, that's – it's inexcusable. You did it all regular year. Like, you got to do it in the playoffs. And that's why it's, like – when everybody says they're shocked, well, I don't know. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure they are shocked, but I'm just curious if, if to a man, that Bruins team can look themselves in the mirror and say that they gave it their best effort. And personally, it's not that they're going out there and saying, I'm going to give it 75%, but they're just, they just, they, they were not very, they weren't, yes, they came back at different times, but what would they do when they, when they come back in games? They give it right away. They were, Florida was just hungrier when it mattered most. I don't know. So and I'm, they, I'm at a lot of words, really. They didn't have any games that were a full 60 minute efforts. I mean, they had, they, I mean, even game seven, I thought that game was over and they lost it way earlier than they did. Like, I didn't think it was going to need overtime. I was like, that, this yeah. is done. Like, there was, no the air left. there was no air left in the building. It was like, like, it, it almost felt like you couldn't breathe. Like, and it was quiet. And, you know, like, there was even moments of booing, like, yeah. Not everybody, mm -hmm. but like, and just like gas down like, to nothing. It was, it was very noticeable. It was so bad. It was like, there were like gasps when they were down to nothing. And, and this pass doesn't connect. And it's just like, it was, everybody was just not sh like they were, everybody was shocked. Every mistake that they couldn't get their shit together. Um, and I really thought that this, that was going to be a regulation loss. Honestly, I was like, well, this is over. Yeah. Like I'm, everybody in that building didn't want to be there anymore. And then all of a sudden the comeback starts <laughs> and it's like, okay, wow, maybe they'll get by into the next round on the skin of their teeth. But if we're being honest, they were not the better team in game no. seven. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Bridget, I would, I would even say almost made it like it's it just, it was just, as, you were kind of hoping that they just somehow found a way to win that game, like hold on to it, that three, two lead. And, just reset for the next round. But if they looked like that again in the next round, they'd be out in, you know, they Toronto would have well, beat them in like five games. No, but I I think Florida and I I obviously should have seen this come going coming in, but I do think Florida was like a particularly bad matchup because of how good four checking they are. And I guess maybe the Bruins didn't face enough great four checks during the season, but you know, Florida was number one or two in the league all year in terms of four check offense. And that clearly proved to be an Achilles heel. Like if you're looking at what was the biggest difference, it was that it was Florida's four check pinning the Bruins in forcing mistakes in, you know, disrupting their breakouts. Sounds familiar. And, hmm. and I'm you know, trying not to say I told you so, but 
Well, but I, I mean, this point in the last podcast, the Bruins still had enough to win the series, even with it. Like, yeah, Florida's no, forecheck inevitably that. was going to force mistakes because they're just too good not to. Like, that team, look what they just did to Toronto in game one. Like, they're mm-hmm. going to do that to everyone they face. But the Bruins had enough other ways to win the series, even with accepting a certain number of mistakes because of Florida's forecheck. What's really annoying is that they made unforced mistakes in addition to the forced ones. And that's where you lose a series. Like that's where what you can't overcome. The ones that are forced, you tip your cap and you say, great play by Matthew Kachuk. The unforced ones, you know, Connor Clifton's pass coming out of the zone, Bertuzzi's backhand pass to no one, all marked behind the net, like that stuff. That's where, like, there's no tip in your cap. That's where you're just like, we did to ourselves. We shot ourselves in the foot. Like, even with all the good things the Panthers did, it was there for us if we just cleaned up our own act. And they didn't. Yeah, that's their fault. Yeah. That's why they deserve all the criticism they get because, you know what, the te- winning teams don't make those mistakes. And I don't know how you go out there and win 65 games. And then, and it's, look, so if people sit there and say the Bruins weren't as good as their record indicated, then it's totally fair now. Like, I mean, look, I, whatever. I just feel like I, – I, I said sounds familiar because – you look at how they lost to St. Louis in 19, you know, Tampa and, and, and uh, the Islanders and Carolina in subsequent years, like the Bruins. And, and, and we're talking, we're talking different decors, except for a couple guys, we're talking different coaches, but yet the same core Bruins are still here. And, and that's, that, that's what, that's what beats this, the, these Bruins teams in playoffs teams that wear you down. So it's like, I'm just so sick of that being the reason every year. Now we're talking at, that they get eliminated. Why they get eliminated because the other team wore them down in the four check. Well, why? They went out and got new guys. They have different coaches. They were a better team. They were deeper. I they just had don't guys, they added guys that you can't push around. <laughs> yeah. Where was Garnet um, Hathaway in the series? I know. Well, so that's like the other side of it is, you know, if we're talking about, well, Florida's forecheck was great. Other teams with great forechecks have won in the playoffs. The Bruins tried to improve their forecheck game this year. And at times I thought in the regular season they clearly had, but it didn't really feel like it was there nearly enough in this series, was it? Like, how how often did we feel like, oh man, they're all over the Panthers' defense and they're hammering these guys and they're forcing turnovers? Like, I didn't really think they were doing a, a that. Certainly not nearly as much as Florida was, but even compared to like the way they played down the stretch, I didn't. I don't think we saw enough of that and. You know, to an extent, some of that's tied together. If you're struggling to get out of your own zone, then you're not in position to be dumping pucks into good areas and get in on the four check. Like, it's all kind of connected. But, you know, I did think that the the Bruins' own four check game also wasn't, wasn't as good as it should have been. And, like, if you look at the numbers on the season, they were basically an average four checking team. But I thought that their deadline moves, especially, you know, Bertuzzi and Hathaway, like, had helped down the stretch. Um, but I didn't think they made, they made enough of an impact there. Yeah. And I kind of want to step back into the rainy, gloomy day in Boston. That was breakup day because, um, some of the answers, like obviously got to this Krejci said that it was like, this was a, a loss comparable to losing the series against St. Louis in 2019. Um, a lot of guys had that same sinking feeling that they had that year when they came really close and they just thought they had the team to get it done. Um, Krejci said, these are the best defensemen I've ever played with. I've played with a lot of great defensemen. Cause if you think back, you know, playing with Krug, Chara, um, Boyd, Chuck McQuaid, like they're, they're, you can name a lot of good Bruins defensemen over the last 10 years. Um, but he thought this is the best decor that they've been able to put together. Um, and he just thought there was the best goalie situation that they've been able to put together. Um, and he started listing off the different aspects of the team, why he thought they were going to have a real shot this year. Um, so, and, and I did feel bad for Krejci and I didn't, I didn't get a chance to comment on this earlier when Scott started talking about Krejci and Bergeron, but um, I didn't realize this, but it came up in his in his interview that his family wasn't here this season. His yeah, they're in, they're in South Carolina. 
So his family wasn't in Boston and he said that it was the best season and the worst season at the same time for him because, and he said, if the team wasn't as good as they were, I would have packed it up mid season and I would have gone home because he missed his family. Um, and so do you see this team being this good next year? No. Does that, does that mean Krejci doesn't even want to try? Probably. And he said he wants to make his decision pretty quickly. Um, so he's going to go back home, meet his family. He was one of the guys who said, I'm getting out of here. Like I'm going right home. Um, wanted to be with his family and it hurt him this year that he wasn't. So, um, it's different if his family had come and been in Boston and it's kind of like, okay, well we can give it one more shot. But if your family's not going to be there, that's a huge sacrifice that you're making and that they're making. And we had heard him give his wife credit in the past about, you know, being cool with him doing it. But at the end of the day, sometimes even if both of both sides are cool doing it, then it just might not, you might not be happy doing it when, when it actually happens. So um, that I think makes me lean that Krejci's not coming back. I also feel like the fact that he wasn't able to help for all seven games, which he alluded, alluded to met, made him feel like he hurt the team and he doesn't want to feel like that. Um, so I kind of got the sense that he was making the decision to leave. Um, if I'm being honest, he obviously said the same thing that Bergeron said, which was to either Bruins or retirement. He doesn't want to go back and play in the Czech Republic. But when he was asked if Bergeron's decision played into his, he said no. Um, whereas Bergeron, when he was asked if Krejci's decision played into his, he said, oh, wait a minute, I didn't think of that. So I honestly do think Bergeron hasn't decided yet based on some of his answers. But if Krejci's... So willing to make his uh, decision in the next two to three weeks. You got to think he's already leaning one way. So great. Great. You said he felt like he let the team down because he didn't get to play in all seven games. Well, he shouldn't, he shouldn't feel that way because they won the three games that he didn't play in and he, they lost the four games he did play in. So maybe uh, there's a little irony there and they would have won. Had he not well, then that still makes you feel bad. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Yeah. A little they, bit. they won one of the ones he played game one, but. Oh, you're right. Yeah. But yeah, that was in spite of. No, look, he's he's a um, he's a great Bruin. Obviously, if this is it for him, then he deserves a ton of uh, accolades and recognition for what he's done. Uh, I don't know. I, look, same thing with Bergeron too. Like when you when you guys brought it up earlier, if I'm if I'm Bergeron, I uh, from a competitive standpoint, I, I mean, can still. Guest. What's that? <laughs> People watching on YouTube can can see that we have a guest. Yeah, I knew he'd be here at some point. <laughs> He's he's a you know he's a camera hog. He likes to get his face on camera. Uh, Xerxes, Xerxes we'll, the cat. Oh, he's gonna itch himself now. Sorry guys. We'll get, we'll, we'll get his take in a minute. He's clearly a Panthers fan. Um, <laughs> so if I'm Bergeron, like from a competitive standpoint, yeah, he still has it. But if I'm him, I'm seriously questioning. Can can my body hold up for for the playoffs? Like he went, he played. Did he play in all 82 games this year leading up or close to it before Montreal? He played most of the games, right? He did. He played – he didn't play in all 82, but for most of the season, he was on the list, the short list of guys that had played every game. So Yeah, he, he rested four. I think he ended up at okay. 78. But only so, at the very end. Yeah. I would I would feel discouraged if I were him. I would feel like, okay, so even if, even if I do talk to my wife and, and my family and we decide that I'm going to give it another go, it's like I would be discouraged. It's like – Okay, but like, am I gonna get hurt again when it matters most? And that's like I a, actually feel like he was encouraged because once someone asked him, did did you think that your health held up the like better than you expected? Mostly, I think this answer was mostly about the regular season, but he said yes. Like he didn't during the regular season, he felt like and you know NHL caliber one hundred percent. Like wasn't dealing with injuries. Um, recovered from surgery, you know, and if he doesn't need surgery this off season, he's already setting himself up, um, you know, for, to be a little bit ahead of schedule for next year. Um, he had, was it elbow surgery in the off season? Yeah. Before? And so like, you know, not having to rehab from an injury in the off season that, that helps um, going into next year. And I do think he felt pretty comfortable playing most of the year. It just was that one freak, thing in that Montreal game, which he confirmed that it was something that happened in that first period in that game. And he said like, you know, it was all part of the plan. So they were never going to go away from the plan. And then at the end, he said, if I had a crystal ball, obviously I wouldn't have played in that game, but 
I mean, that's revisionist, just like most of the other stuff we've been talking about. But yeah. aside yeah. from that, he felt pretty good most of the year. Yeah, because like the things he's been concerned about for years, because he's dealt with them for years, is groin and hips. And he even said that yesterday. And isn't it two years in a row he's got to the end of the year and those have felt good? You know, yeah. last year was the elbow he he needed surgery on. And this year it's the back that that pops up. But the the stuff that like has been on and off that he's been dealing with for years has actually held up for two years in a row. So I think that part of it, at least he's encouraged by, but yeah, I mean, we'll see ultimately though, we still end up with an injury at the end. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Like, like I said, like I, I, I don't know if it's 50, 50. I don't, I don't know which way I'm leaning. Like after the loss on Sunday, I was certainly leaning towards that being it just because of how emotional he, he looked, but he looked really emotional last year after, game yeah. seven too. So I don't know if that really tells us, you know, one way or another, but um, obviously he could come back and play. He's going to win the Selkie this year. Uh, by the way, he got, they officially announced that he was one of the three finalists that came out on a Tuesday night. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, really like if you're the Bruins, it would really be ideal if, you know, you're kind of at a point where you could slide Bergeron down the lineup a little bit and, you know, I don't know about third line, but at least like a clear number two center. And, you know, it'd be great if like his ice time got down to around like 16 minutes or so on a consistent basis. But the reality is, is like he would, he would still be the number one center or, you know, 1A with Zaka if, if Zaka is really ready to step up. But like, they would still be so reliant on him if he came back. Like he's 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 too good, and they don't have another clear answer, you know, to to pick up the slack if you were if you were to make a conscious effort to to limit his minutes. Yeah, and, and uh, if you were able, if Krejci left, say, and you were able to somehow bring back Bertuzzi, you could run back to lines that work for you late in the season, which was would be Bertuzzi, Zaka Pasternak, and Marshawn, Bergeron, DeBrusque. So those are two of your top lines that you're, you'd be keeping together if you could somehow get Bertuzzi to sign. and um, Or you could, you know, keep the check line together instead if Krejci wants to come back. But I, I really don't see him coming back. But then you have the same situation with your third line, Hall, Coyle, Frederick. And you really, you're looking at a roster that – isn't that changed um, from this past year in terms of the forward lines? But, um, yeah, I, I do think, though, if, if you're bringing back Bertuzzi, I, like, I almost feel like Hall has to go. Like yeah, It, it does Bertuzzi. really feel like one or the other because just with, with the cap crunch they have, like you, you can't have that much money tied up in, in wings. It was, yeah. you know, it was such an enormous luxury this year to have Hall as a third liner, but like if, if he's back, he's he's in the top six, so... Bertuzzi would be in the top six and it almost feels like you have to, you know, if you're, if you're signing Bertuzzi, like I almost feel like you have to trade Hall well, away, especially, yeah. especially if Bertuzzi is going to get over 5 million. Like I don't really see how else you, you make it work. Well, and Hall's contract is 6 million. That's, I mean, it's a pretty big contract in terms of when you look through some of the other like depth forwards, like he's at 6 million, Charlie Coyle's at five and a quarter. Well, those are third line guys that are taking up quite a bit of your cap. And even Jake DeBrusque is only at 4 million, um, but he's only here with you for one more year. And then he becomes an unrestricted free agent. So maybe that plays into it. Whereas Hall and Coyle have a little bit of time left on their term. Um, I think, you know, Zaka is locked in for another four years. I don't think they're going to try, they would try to move him. He seems like a piece that they're absolutely projecting into their future to have here. So um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Hall or DeBrusque probably make the most sense. And it would be De, – DeBrusque would make more sense if you, you know, if you really think he would leave in free agency and you want to get something back for him. I, I don't I don't know. Um, I guess this move isn't even about getting anything back. It's about just clearing the books <laughs> to try to get money. Right. And, and again, what would be nice is if somebody like uh, Fabian Lysel can put on 15 pounds of muscle this offseason and maybe – 
midseason next year, he's a full time fixture on your third line on le- on the left side because you don't have a Taylor Hall anymore. Like part of this too is that the Bruins, like you have these kids in the in the system that some of them you think could play, like Merkerloff. Like I don't know if he projects next year at some point of the year afterwards, but like some. There's a, there's a silver lining to some of these guys not being able to hold on to, and that is let's see what you have in some of these players. And I think that's something to look forward to as well. And then, look, I think Taylor Hall certainly had a fantastic postseason. Well, he was a little bit quiet in the last couple of games, but um, he had injuries this year. But I don't – look, he's, he's, he gets another year older. He's, he can still motor, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't – He's a good he's a good player to have, but I, I'm not too concerned if they can't find a way to hold on to him because because hopefully you can have somebody in like Lysel who can come in with some fresh legs, or if it's not Lysel, it could be somebody else. But I would I, I just I just like Bertuzzi. I, I like his style of play better, and I like his age a little bit better, obviously. So yes, yeah, something. The more I, I look at the cap though, like I'm just looking at it now, that Pasta contract really fucks him over. Like that is gonna be that's a huge step up from like what Pasternak's getting paid this year, it's... I mean, it depends how you look at it. You're not getting 60-plus goal scores. Right. So don't do it. No, yeah, I was going to say, you, mean, you're more fucked terms, over if he's gone. No, I mean, in terms of trying to make the numbers work. <laughs> and, well, no, and, what, what fucks them over a lot more than that is the $4.5 million bonuses from Krejci and Bergeron's contract, which I think their initial plan was to try to have some cap space at the end of the year to absorb that. And Taylor Hall and Nick Felino get injured days before the trade deadline. And they say, well, screw that. We're already all in. Let's get Tyler Bertuzzi. And we're going to have four and a half million dollars in bonus overage. Like, that's just what it is. That that and- was that was really the last straw was like once they had to use long term IR more and went and added Bertuzzi. It was, you know, all that money was going to carry over. And that's. If you remember, like that's what hurt them in 2014 15 was Jerome McGinley's bonuses carrying over and really hampering what Shirelli could do with the cap. And they missed the playoffs that next year, and Shirelli gets fired. And that's why Don Sweeney had to hit the reset button when he first took over. So that's why I think, you know, especially if Berger and Krejci both retire, I kind of think, again, it's not a rebuild, it's not a teardown, but I do think you have to hit that reset button and accept that the next year or two might be tough and you just hope, you know, two, three, four years from now, you're, you're ready to go again. And, you know, your Lysel and Merkulov and Lori are ready to be sort of the next, the next core on top of, you know, coming up behind your, your McAvoy Pasternak class. So, um, and if you're going to do that, then you absolutely trade Taylor Hall because there's no point in keeping a 32, 33 year old Taylor Hall around for two years of resetting like that doesn't what about as uh, well trade him away and get whatever you can what about uh so if if bergeron and Krejci both retire let's just say going into next year if you don't have those two guys mainly bergeron like i think we all agree if there's no Krejci, they can still pretty much achieve what they might want to achieve but if bergeron's not back next year this is, this is a question i posed last offseason if bergeron doesn't come back next year they're not winning a cup we all agree on that right Okay. Yep. So the point you just made about Taylor Hall, 31 years old. What about a 35 or 36 year old Brad Marchand, 37 year old Brad Marchand? If what, why, why, if you can, if you can trade him for to really help that uh, accelerate a potential uh, stockpiling during a rebuild, what's the point of keeping him around during during a rebuild? Wasn't this a wasn't this like a Milbury talking point at one point? Was it last year or two years ago? I feel well, like on one of our shows, it was like trade them at the deadline and, and you know, get yeah, what you can. Not if they're competitive, but if you know going into a year that you don't have a number one center, to, to I'm just going to just going off of what Scott said about Taylor Hall. Why would you want a 31 year old Taylor Hall around for a rebuild? Why would you want a 37 year old Brad Marsh around for a rebuild if you can? Because they're not going to, they're not doing a full rebuild. That's, that's just like, well, I don't if know. You don't have, so you know. not, here's, here's my answer because, because Brad Marsh is your captain if Patrice Bergeron retires. And I think, him setting the tone and making sure that everyone is approaching these next couple of years, this bridge, whatever. I think there's real value in that and still having him as a leader and still having his work ethics, setting the example and setting the tone for everyone. Not that I 
don't to- you know trust Charlie McAvoy or David Pasternak if they would be the next C if you trade Marshand, but I wonder if everyone's building their game exactly the right way if you lose Bergeron, Krejci, Marshand all at once. So I think there's still real value in having Brad Marshand as your captain through the next couple of years. Um, he like made a case for himself. It was like he was campaigning for to be the next Bergeron when Bergeron was out and he was being so well behaved and he was doing all the right things. They're going to have to try to get some of those first round picks back though. Some way, right. You would imagine. I mean, when's their next first round pick two years from now? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if they're gonna like it. I would say at the very least, like you've got to get a second round pick somewhere because they don't have any of those in the next three drafts. So yeah, you want to recoup some of those picks to me, whether it's a first rounder or not, I don't know. I mean, if you can, if you can find someone who makes your crazy offer, like when they traded Milan Lucic and got a mid first out of that, then great. You know, to me, like Taylor Hall would be like the Milan Lucic comparable, like, Someone that in my mind, I'm like, I don't really think he's worth a first anymore. But maybe someone out there thinks he is. Like, I don't know. Well, because like to the point Bridget just made a few minutes ago, she said they're they're not going to fully rebuild. And I I agree with you. I was more so speaking hypothetically. But another reason why they shouldn't fully rebuild is because if they do tank, they don't have the first round picks. So like, they'd be be tanking for nothing. There's absolutely no part part right. to it yeah. right no there's not um that's that's a great point i i did want to clarify what i meant about the pasta knock thing though because i feel like you guys immediately like took it a different way than i meant it pasta knock's contract goes up five million from this bridget past. hates david pasta knock title for the <laughs> yeah episode. i mean uh, there's no way in hell i was saying oh you should have signed him like no this this and this is what he deserves but in terms of where your money is tied up next year that's $5 million more that's going to Pasternak, right? So it's not like you're getting him back at the same price you had him this year. He's $5 million more expensive next year. Plus you had the four and a half from the bonuses from Krejci and Bergeron. And that's where your your money is going. And then you're looking at, okay, who who like where can we dump some of this money? Even if you dump Grizzlick, Forbert, Hall, I'm still not even sure you have enough money for Bertuzzi. Like it's it that's how crazy it is. Um yeah. with you, you do if you if you do that much, but if you by if the way, you, like we've barely touched on this, but also Lena Salmark makes five million and mm-hmm. he's never gonna have higher value than he has right now. I mean, I guess if he had been better in the playoffs, that helps, yeah. but you know, if like I would be seriously considering trading one of the goalies and Allmark gets you something in return and frees up money. Trading Swayman's tough because he, he, he's an RFA. You're not going to get maximum value if you, you know, if you're trying to trade him because his new team would have to negotiate the contract. Um, but they, they didn't use the rotation in the playoffs this year. So if you're, if you're not going to use both goalies and take advantage of that, then you might as well trade them. Like Brendan Bussey had a really good year in the HL. I think, he's probably ready to be a backup in the NHL. So I would absolutely be open to that as well. And that's certainly another piece that could free up a a decent chunk of money. Well, look at the, uh, I just feel like goaltending in the, in in the NHL these days, there's a lot of promising young goalies out there in different leagues. And I just, I just think you can find, you don't, you can find somebody. And, And I was just looking up the, the goalie for, for the devils right now the Schmied kid like he was he was a he was a what's it say 100 he was picked 136th overall in 2018 like and he's backstop in the devils like into the, in the playoffs right now like you can find you can find guys and i know I, i'm not trying to like oversimplify things i just think there's an abundance of talent out there you you, you don't have to be married to to the to Omar, in my opinion Swayman was a fourth round pick and Swayman, I feel like maybe you can glean a little bit about what they might be planning for their future with whatever contract they give Swayman um, with his restricted free agent contract. That's, that's coming up this off season. So um, he was a deep pick and you've developed him internally. So that makes, you know, because he's a restricted free agent, that means he is not going to get as 
big of a payday as somebody that could go on the open market and, and shop different teams and whatnot. But, um, but I do want to say, By Scott, the way, just on Swayman, I'll go back to uh, my evolving hockey projections here. They have him as an RFA three years, 4.1 million a year, which actually the money actually seems a little higher than I was expecting, but it would be hard to argue against him deserving that. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, you're right. Um, I just wonder, I say, I think maybe the term, how long the term is kind of might tell you what direction they might want to go in. If it's right. Like, I mean, maybe you can lower that a a V like it, mm-hmm. try to do five years, you know, what like 3.6 or something like that. I, I don't yeah. know, but. And by it, the way, it, getting rid of, getting rid of girls like Forbert and Hall, like I said, does not open enough cap space for Bertuzzi at the projected um, amount that you said, just so you know, because of the bonuses from Krejci and Bergeron. I'm looking at the cap right now. Well, no, it, it, I mean, Hall's 6 million, like that, Hall that six, alone. Yeah, but you're adding you're adding uh five and a half for pasta that you and then four and a half from But that's all that's all taken into account already though. In yeah, maybe we're looking at different things here. They but, they have five million dollars of cap space to play with right now. So you have to free more up on top of that. Oh, okay. Uh but that's already I, taken into account pasta narc's number jumping and all of that. I, I, I got I have one final question for you two for on my end before we wrap up. And I'm gonna refer to a tweet that Scott put out last night watching the Panthers. Oh, sorry about that microphone. Uh put it watching the uh, Panthers Maple Leafs game. You, you made you made a comment about just the Panthers play and how it some teams just they just it all clicks at the right time. And so all, all year we talk about the President's Trophy curse and the President's Trophy curse. My, I guess my question is, in light of recent events, Scott, you were never a believer in the President's Trophy curse. I'm asking if your opinion on that has changed. And the reason I ask you that, to link it back to the Panthers tweet that you had, is a big reason that the Panthers are clicking all at the same time, I feel like, is just because of the situation that they were in down the stretch in the second half of the year of having to play for their lives all year. I just felt like they were, they were just jiving and i and i and i think that the reason the president's trophy curse might be a thing is we talked about it it's not because the roster isn't good or the talent's not there but is it tough to play your best hockey of the year going into the playoffs when you just it's you just don't have that legitimate desperation to get in you can try to manufacture it i'm guessing i guess i'm asking does the president's trophy curse is is that why it might be that way because teams just can't replicate desperation when they until it's too late it might be part of it. I, I, I still don't believe in the curse. What I believe in is parity. Like I, no, take, you know, 43 point difference aside out of it. Like I just think the difference between a one and eight in the NHL just isn't the same as it is in other sports. It's, it's not the NBA where, you know, your one seed has three superstars and your eight seed has none. It's not the NFL where your one seed has Patrick Mahomes and your seven seed or whatever has, you know, Mac Jones, sorry, Mac, but like that, it, it's just, it's just not the same as, as other sports. Like the closest, I guess would be baseball where, you know, a team's pitching rotation can, can get hot and you knock off the top team. But yeah, I just think no matter how deep your roster is and the Bruins obviously was very deep, like in a salary cap league where, pretty much every playoff team is spending to the cap. There's just, there's not going to be that huge of a difference between the top seed and the eighth seed. Like talent level is going to, you know, you look at that Panthers team, like there's a lot of talent there and that's because they've spent to the cap and they've spent on it. So um, I don't, I don't believe in the curse. I just think there's, think- there's too much parity and you know, the, there's not going to be a huge difference from top to bottom. That's why we see so many upsets every year. I think that's kind of what Brian means though, right? Like the curse isn't just like, obviously we don't believe in in the curse. We don't believe in witchcraft. (laughs) We don't believe Scott doesn't believe in karma. He does believe in the hockey gods though. Um, But like, obviously we're not saying they're really witchcraft at play, like the voodoo, like that. No. Um, I think what Brian's getting at is um, 
there's a reason why presence there's there's the underlying reason that everybody just lazily says is the curse um which are the the factors that are really going on that is why president's trophy teams struggle and that's that's what you're saying brian um yep, i also exactly. think par parity for one but also um i think home ice is not really as big as like home court advantage in basketball um so that like you were wondering if that was going to factor into the Bruins series it didn't really feel like it did obviously they lo lose three of those games at home including game seven so sometimes that can make a difference I mean when you think about the year that the Bruins beat Vancouver that was at Vancouver St. Louis beats the Bruins in Boston uh to win the Stanley Cup in 2019 um I the series that go along and you go to game seven, you really don't necessarily feel like home ice is such a huge thing. Um, so there, there are definitely a lot of things that underlie the, the curse, so to speak. Um, but this year, though, it did feel like there was enough that the Bruins had to combat any of those things that I just listed. Um, and they did not. And so because of that, the curse will be talked about in Boston. The choking will be talked about in Boston. I'm going to have to go listen to Adam Jones uh, talk about effort from now until the end of time uh, about how this team, he knew it. This team, their goaltending was no good and he knew it. They were going to choke, but like, obviously he, he did. He's, he must have known he, it. he's not, uh, you know, a psychic either. And uh, he, he, you know, sometimes, well, sometimes like you, you're right on accident. It happens to us all the time. <laughs> Even you can base everything off of facts. The fact that Scott and I were at every home game the whole year and saw it all with our own eyes. Uh, sometimes you can just make it up and you're the, right. The real curse, the real curse was Jones jumping on the bandwagon. We, we should have known it was over uh, yeah. the, the second he, he went on air and said they were going to win the cup. It, yeah. We should have known that was it. Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad I haven't seen him in the office since because I'm sure he's going to be like, oh, I told you, Bridget, the goaltending sucked. <laughs> so yeah. well, I'm going to avoid the office is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we should wrap it up right now. We have uh, Scott has places to be. We all have places to be here. Um, thank you all for listening. We will talk next week after – uh, ownership and, and management speak to the media. So once again, and sorry, cause last episode, Bridget, I don't know if you saw this, but my internet just shit the bed. So Scott, yeah, the last like five minutes of the yeah. going, all right, well, guess yeah. me now. <laughs> so, and you did a great job, Scott speaking on behalf of myself and Bridget. I couldn't have said it any better. We really do appreciate everybody listening and watching all year. We up the volume to three episodes a week and we did one after every game in the playoffs, whatever that ended up being. So we appreciate the just your listenership and support. And if you guys have any words to echo that, but yeah. Thank you and also, that. yeah, but all of that for sure. And we'll also just plug one last Sunday skate this weekend, 10 AM. So, you know, if you, if you haven't had enough therapy yet and there's still, still stuff you want to get off your chest, uh, you can tune, tune in me and razor Colin, whatever. I can't wait to hear what Razor has to say because he was the the one positive person going into the game, and he also thought Allmark was going to play, but it was Swayman. So anyway, it would you know too bad we don't have more on the horizon, <laughs> but we just have the last one. Um, yeah, and we're still going to keep doing the podcast in the off season. So I mean, and as far as I know, none of us are free agents, so I think I think we should be back. <laughs> Yeah, well, my bonus we'll is carrying for next year, so we'll see if we can fit everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think we should fit under the cap, but we're, we're still figuring yeah. it out. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next week.